In this series of videos I'm attempting to repair and restore this PDP 1134 vintage computer. In the previous video I went over how I was going about testing what I believed was a fault on the uh, M8266 CPU control board which is this front board that we're looking at now. And I was going around testing uh, various PROMs and I believe that um, at least one of the PROMs on this board has failed. And the reason I believe that is um, I found a, uh, a dead short to the plus 5 volt rail on a particular uh, output line of the PROMs. And there are four PROMs that are connected to that particular line. And um, what I didn't say in the previous video is that the short was on this 7404 input. And what I've done is I've actually just cut the pin. You can't see it. It's pin 3. I've just cut the pin so it's not now connected. It is dead short to the plus 5 volt rail, but um, so the, the board won't run like this because this is part of the uh, kind of feedback loop for the, um, the address uh, control and uh, the uh, instruction decoder. Uh, but it should allow me to see if there's anything else going on with that particular um, signal line. And I found various issues, so what I've decided to do is take out the four PROMs that are uh, on that uh, particular line or that are connected to that line read them and see if any of the bits appear to be stuck I don't know what the content should be yet um, but if any of the bits aren't toggling at least that will tell me that uh, the problem is actually faulty I won't be able to do much about it at the time but I'm just trying to narrow down uh, what faults this machine has I know it has other faults as well but uh, I need to get the CPU up to the point where at least it can kind of uh, limp along um, one thing I've been asked to show uh, previously is how I go about removing ICs from boards like this. And I see there's a lot of um, people saying these boards are very difficult to desolder. And that's kind of true that they are fairly tricky. They're not impossible. You can um, rework them without doing any damage. And I've been asked to show how I go about this sort of thing. And um, I don't normally show removing ICs, that sort of thing. There are plenty of um, videos on YouTube showing that. Um, but I thought I'd show uh, at least one. And um, the method I use varies depending on the type of board. So I'll just quickly describe the various methods I use. I'll get this board popped out and I'll just demonstrate removing uh, one of the devices. Excuse the lighting here, this is not my usual filming location so uh, the light won't be too good. Um, but just a quick discussion of the equipment that I use for various types of reworking. So I have quite a few different pieces of equipment. I've got uh, an infrared rework station, so this just uses a, an extremely bright intense uh, infrared lamp and uh, that can be used to uh, heat up uh, components or PCBs got a soldering iron attached and what you normally do is make up some sort of mask and that fits over the um, the area of the PCB you want to rework to just expose the component you're trying to work on. It's got a um, preheat plate underneath so that preheats the PCB 100 degrees or so and um, that just makes the uh, kind of rework cycle much faster. I hardly ever use this. I maybe use this three or four times a year. It's mostly for surface mount uh, work so most of the repairs that you see uh, I don't use this. I have a hot air rework station as well, similar sort of purpose to this and for the same reason I don't use that much either. When I first started in electronics I used one of these, so obviously you've probably all seen these, just a desolder pump and um, all you do is you push the plunger down, heat up the joint, put the tip onto the joint and then when the solder's molten you push the button and it sucks up the solder. These work quite well. I don't use these anymore and I certainly wouldn't use it to rework a delicate board. One of the problems with them is when you're um, touching the board, there's kind of a recoil to this and because uh, when the joint's hot, the glue holding the pad down is fairly loose, that sudden jolt, uh, which is kind of downwards, um, can just easily push the pad off the board. So I don't use this. I may sometimes use it if I'm working on an old radio that has solder tags and I want to remove a lot of solder, um, but I very rarely use these. I also have uh, tools like this. This is an uh, uh, electric version of the solder pump we just looked at. Works in a very similar way. It's got a heated tip on this though, so you don't need a separate iron. 
Uh, I quite often use it with a separate iron, so I use this and an iron, so I'll have the iron on the back of the board, this on the front, um, in fact I use it the other way around normally, I normally have this on the pin side of the board, and then I heat up the other side at the same time, push the button, there's a pump in here, and it sucks the solder into the little clear uh, collector you can see there. Again, very rarely use this, it's got its uses and um, it can be quite useful, uh, you can adjust the temperature, but uh, as I say, I very rarely uh, make use of this. Various other methods uh, you can use. Uh, some people uh, cut the pins off ICs to remove them and then use a soldering iron to remove the pins one at a time, clean up the holes, and then um, put the new components in. Uh, you can do that. I don't think I've ever done that. I may have done that once, um, but I, it's not a method I normally use uh, for several reasons. One is it puts a lot of stress on the board. Um, but also, most of the time, even if I have what I believe is a faulty component, I want to try and get it out without causing further damage, just to confirm uh, my suspicions as to what's failed, how it's failed, and to further educate myself so I get more of an understanding for the future. And so just uh, cutting the, the legs off makes uh, that impossible, so you never know was the component faulty, in what way was it faulty, how does that tie with what you're observing, uh, with the scope of the analyzer or, or the behavior of the thing you're trying to repair. Very good learning tool to uh, analyze components after you've removed them. So I always try and get them out intact, even if I think they're faulty. Uh, so that leads me on to the method I use most. And I probably use this method, I guess, over 90% of the time. So I don't use the rework stations. Uh, what I use most of the time is this, and this is a desolder braid. And um, I have quite a few different um, sizes of this, depending on what I'm trying to desolder. So all it is, it's kind of like uh, the uh, braided copper um, conductor in coaxial cable that's been flattened. And uh, it's just braided copper, but it's impregnated with um, some kind of flux. And um, all you do is you heat up the joint uh, with this applied to the joints, the solder in theory should melt and flow into the uh, braid because the, um, the wick effect is stronger into the braid because the fibres are closer together than the effect on the board uh, with the pin going through the hole. So the uh, general tendency is for the solder to be drawn out of the joint and into the solder braid. This is consumable so you can't reuse it once you've used a bit you have to cut it off and throw it away. This is relatively expensive, it's probably £30 a reel, um, but a reel does last a reasonable amount of time. I get through maybe a reel a month, but only because I do a huge amount of uh, this type of work. Uh, this is the method I use because it puts least risk at the, onto the board. Uh, the, so what you need is the, the braid, quite often you need some flux, you need uh, decent tweezers, a good soldering iron, that, that is the key to this being um, most successful. If you have a cheap iron, you will really struggle to make this work properly. Not only do you need a good iron, but you need to have the right sort of tip. So this type of kind of conical tip is not really suitable. What you need is a large wedge type tip, and the size of the tip you use is dependent on the nature of the board that you're working on. So uh, essentially all we're going to be doing is using the iron to heat up the joint through the braid, draw out the uh, solder, but then there are several additional steps that I carry out that minimises the chance of damaging the board, and that's what I really want to go over today. I'm trying to, I so I'll try and show this through the microscope. Unfortunately, the camera on my microscope um, hasn't got the same focal plane as the eyepieces, so it makes it very difficult to film anything through it, because I have to either focus for the camera or focus for the eyepieces. And of course I don't want to damage this board that we're going to be working on today, so I do need to be fairly careful. Other things you're going to need, small brush, some kitchen towel and some isopropyl alcohol. And as I say, I'll go through it step by step. And uh, if you're familiar with doing this, you might want to skip this video, but uh, if you haven't done this sort of thing before, hopefully you might find some of this uh, useful. I'm set up to begin desoldering. Uh, unfortunately my uh, microscope camera doesn't have a microphone and there's no way to um, effectively capture uh, audio on this system at the same time as the video so 
I'll have to do a voiceover uh, of what I'm doing as I proceed and then we'll have a look uh, at the end and see how it turns out. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to see what I'm doing. As I say, it's not the best camera in the world, but um, I've been asked to show this and hopefully you'll be able to see what I'm doing. So once I've got all the pins released and I, I'm always pushing down on the pads, I never try and pull up and I never try and kind of force the chip out of the board. I wait until it appears to be loose. So this one now moves. So I should be able to just lift this out of the board without any undue force. So just, as you can see, just lift straight out. Doesn't pull any pads up. Um, obviously all the flux now needs cleaning off the board. So what I'll do is clean up the board, make sure I haven't damaged any pads and then I can put the uh, device into the uh, reader and uh, check this one and then just do the same with the rest of them. So I'll get the board cleaned up and we'll have a look at it under the microscope and uh, see if it still looks okay.
So as you can see, the board is undamaged, all the tracks are intact, all the pads and uh, annular rings are fine. Um, it took about 10 minutes to do that and that's working around the camera, so it's not terribly time consuming. And it is worth spending the extra time to go through these steps before you try and pull the um, chip off the board. And it's far better doing that than it is spending uh, an age trying to uh, repair the board afterwards. If you're interested, I had the iron set to 320 centigrade and uh, uh, try and keep it as cool as possible. Um, the solder, as you saw, was very dried. It didn't really want to flow, so some um, of the pins had to be you know, have fresh solder applied. Sometimes, and what I'll probably do with the rest of these, in fact, is um, re-solder them before I start trying to remove them. The solder is a bit too dry just to go straight to removal. But um, you can see it's perfectly possible if you're careful, patient, take your time, uh, you can easily get um, the devices off this board without damaging it. And of course, I'll fit sockets to make it uh, easier in the future. Okay, well, hopefully um, you found that interesting if it's the sort of thing that you haven't done before. And uh, if you have done a lot of these and you've got better techniques, then uh, please leave a comment. And just for completeness, this is how it looks once I've soldered the socket back into it. So it's this uh, device here. You can tell it, you can't even really tell it's been uh, removed. Board's undamaged, just flip it over. And uh, of course we now have the socket on the back, or the front. And um, that makes life a lot easier. Um, you could re-solder the new device to the board, of course, if you wanted it to look authentic, but um, I prefer to uh, fit sockets. It future-proofs it and makes uh, life a lot easier should it ever need to be replaced. OK, so uh, apologies if you can see too well through the microscope camera. You see why I don't do much filming through it, uh, but hopefully you can see enough to get the idea as to the technique I was using for this particular board. The technique varies depending on the board type. This um, board, um, I use this technique because the annular rings are very small, the adhesive is not that good, and the other reason is because of the nature of the finish on these boards, in that they don't really have a finish as such, on this side anyway, it's very easy to make them look really horrible if you kind of gouge and press the iron too uh, hard into them, it leaves sort of nasty marks on them. And really with a board like this, you want it to look as pristine as possible when you're finished. So um, I use this technique because it has very low impact on the final appearance of the board. It's quite time consuming to do relative to other techniques. Um, but I say it's about 10 minutes um, for each um, device, so it's not too bad. Uh, depends how many you've got to do, of course. Uh, but I think it's well worth the extra effort to uh, make it look uh, as, uh, as nice as possible when it's done.